Okay, the book of Hebrews, the glorious Jesus. This is uh, lesson number 10 in this series. Title of this particular lesson, Jesus Greater Than the Jewish Religion, part three in this particular section of the book. And uh, if you're following along in your Bibles, uh, it'll be chapter 10 that we're going to cover, chapter 10. So let's do a little review, as we normally do, of uh, the previous chapter that we looked at. Uh, the author, as we have said before many times, is showing, the author of Hebrews, this book, is showing Christ's superiority over the entire system of religion as embodied by the sacrificial rituals of the Old Testament and the Old Testament priesthood. In other words, Jesus as a priest uh, is more effective, is better than the, what the high priest was and uh, what he could do. Now in the final section of this first part of the book, the author reviews and reinforces the idea of the necessity of Jesus' sacrificial death and its effectiveness in, com in comparison to the sacrifices and the, uh, the sacrificial death of animals in the Old Testament. In other words, what Jesus offered was better than what the high priests uh, offered in the Old Testament. Now before, the author argued that Jesus was a greater high priest, well, because of his qualifications. He was, he was God's son. Uh, he was greater because the place where he ministered was better than the earthly high priest, he ministered in heaven, in the heavenly sanctuary, whereas the, uh, the, the, uh, the high priests of the Jewish nation uh, ministered here on earth, albeit they were in a, a beautiful temple, so on and so forth, but it was still something that was here on earth and not uh, in heaven. And also he argues that the type of sacrifice that was offered by Jesus, in other words, he offered himself, uh, this is also a, a much better sacrifice than what the, uh, the high priests uh, could offer. So now, as we move into chapter 10, the author's going to close the case, close his argument, by demonstrating that the results of Jesus' ministry on behalf of the people is also superior than the results of the Jewish high priest's ministry for the Jewish people. And don't get me wrong, he's not denigrating the, relig the Jewish religion. He's not saying it was a waste of time or it was no good. It's just that in comparison to Jesus, you know, it, didn't, it didn't compare. Jesus was the fulfillment of all those things. So don't, don't get me wrong. He's, he's not putting down the Jewish, uh, the Jewish religion. So um, in making this argument you know, that what, what Jesus has done is superior than what could have been accomplished by the, uh, the uh, Jewish high priest, this is going to be the climax of the letter. Uh, in other words, he's arguing if the results of Jesus' ministry on behalf of men are better, then it is proof that everything else is also better. Everything is, is better. So uh, he talks about, first of all, the results of the Jewish high priest's work, and we read about that, chapter 10, beginning in verse 1. He says, for the law since it has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the very form of things, can never, by the same sacrifices which they offer continually, they being the high priests, year by year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered? Because the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have had consciousness of sin. So he asks a kind of a, a question here. If the sacrifices offered in the Old Testament by the priests worked, well then they would have cleansed the consciences of the people who offered them, because they were offered by the authority and the command of the law. Now the proof that the Old Testament sacrifices would have you know, done the job, if you will, the proof of this would be that the people would have stopped offering sacrifices, because they would no longer feel guilty. They would be confident of their salvation. I mean, have you ever realized that not feeling guilty is a benefit of salvation that is produced by the cross? The Old Testament system did not produce that feeling. <laughs> you ever realize that? 
The people never felt free from their guilt as we do in the, in the New Testament. And so the author argues that the shadow, in other words, the outline or the rough sketch, can never be greater than the finished work or the form which is finished. And so the Old Testament sacrifices, he argues, were just the shadow, but not the real thing. A million shadows cannot equal one real thing. The Old Testament sacrifices were merely the shadow of the sacrifice of Christ to come. His was the real thing. Everything else was you know, preparation, getting him ready. And so he keeps writing here, verse three and four. He says, but in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sin, sins year by year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. So he says, as a matter of fact, these sacrifices in the Old Testament were there to serve as a reminder or a remembrance of sin. That was the purpose of the temple sacrifices, to remind the people of sin. It wasn't the actual offering for sin, that was to come much later, when Jesus would come. You know, the Lord's Supper is a remembrance of the sacrifices that takes away sin. It's not a remembrance of sin. I've, I've heard people sometimes you know, who preside at the table say something like, all right, let's focus on our sins and you know, no, <laughs> no. We remember the thing that's taken away our sins. That's what we remember. Um, celebrate, quote, not exactly the right word here. Commemorate is a better word, a more exact words, and words are important. And so the blood or the life of animals, he says, cannot remove sins, no matter how many you sacrifice. And he explains why in the next verse. He said, you could, you could offer a, you know, as many bulls and goats as you want. That blood, that life, is not able to take away sin. So now he's going to talk about Christ's sacrifice. He says, God has always known that animal sacrifice could not remove sin, but now the author explains why Jesus' sacrifice does remove sin. Verse five, therefore, when He comes into the world, He says, meaning he's talking about Jesus now, Sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sins, you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me, to do your will, O God. So the author explains you know, why you know, the sacrifice of bulls you know, doesn't achieve he explains this by using Psalm chapter 40, verses six to eight, which in the original context, as it was written by David, sees David expressing the pledge to do God's will rather than the offering of formal sacrifices. That's what David was talking about when he wrote this. David had great insight. He had great spiritual insight. Well, he had revelation, but a lot of people had, uh, you know, God revealed things to them, but David had great insight as an individual. He understood the essential truth about spiritual life, that obedience to God's will, as he had learned it from the book, was what God wanted and what sustained his soul not the ritual of animal sacrifices, or any sort of ritual, for that matter. So let's keep reading. He says, after saying above, sacrifices and offerings, and whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have not desired, nor have you taken pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, behold, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. 
by this will we have been sacrificed, sanctified, excuse me, through the offering of the body of Jesus once for all. So he quotes the psalm and then he explains the psalm. Okay, and what it means in the context of what he's talking about. So the author of Hebrews takes this quote and this idea to apply to Jesus and His sacrifice. Watch it, here it comes. What makes Jesus' sacrifice effective is that it involves the will of God. That's what, it, that's what gives it its radioactive power. Because in verse nine he says, Jesus was willing, you know, a body you have prepared for me. Jesus was willing to offer himself. Animals have no choice. They have no will. Therefore their value as sacrifice is nil. You could, you could sacrifice a trillion animals and it would count as nothing. Why? Because they have no will. In verse 10 he says, it was God's will that a perfect sacrifice be offered and in doing so, Jesus was doing God's will. So what gives life, what obtains forgiveness is the doing of God's will. The offering of His life would have accomplished nothing, I repeat, the offering of Jesus' life the Son of God would have accomplished nothing had it not been in accordance with God's will. That's what gives it its power. God's will was that a perfect sacrifice be made to atone for the sin of men. That's God's will. The problem is no man could accomplish God's will no matter how hard he tried. So along comes Jesus, right, at the behest of God, the Father, and as, as David says, a body you have prepared for me. Well, which body? Well, the human body of Jesus. You got that ready for me, why? So that I could do your will in the service of mankind. So Jesus knew God's will in what was needed to remove man's sin and He did it. And in so doing, man's sins are removed forever. Now in another lesson, remember, let's take this other piece that I've given you a long time ago and let's fit this into the puzzle, shall we, to get a more perfect picture. So the fact that God desired and demanded that this be done, this is what gives it its power, okay? its authority. So Jesus comes and He needs a human body, right? Because it's a human, a man has lost, you know, Adam has lost, you know, uh, has lost salvation you know, because he sinned. So we need a human in order to, you know, to balance out, one human for one human. Remember I explained to you? But because Jesus had a divine nature, the value of His sacrifice is greater than if it was just an ordinary human being. If just an ordinary human being who happened to live a perfect life and was willing to do God's will and offer it up, that person could only offer one life for one life. But because Jesus had a divine nature, the value, the intrinsic value of his life was such that he knew God's will, he took on a body so he could fulfill God's will, and because he had a divine nature, his sacrifice was enough, more than enough, to pay for the sins of not just one person, but every person that ever lived. So once God's will has been accomplished in this regard, well, there is no need to repeat it. It is done once for all time. Even if a man knew that this was God's will, as I say, he couldn't accomplish it because of his weakness. Jesus with a perfect life, given a human body, knowing God's will, was willing and able 
to do it. You know, I, I, it's very tempting here to divert. This is the argument, brothers and sisters, this is the argument of why Christianity is superior to every other religion. This here is the heart and soul of the argument as to why we do not need another prophet, another latter day prophet, another, you know, another word from God. Why, for what, to tell us what? <laughs> if Jesus resolves the whole problem of man, which is what? Sin. What other thing needs to be taken care of by who? By what prophet? What other religion brings us anything more than Christianity has brought us? But I digress. So the author is going to make here a final summary of Jesus' superiority. Remember I said this book, Hebrews, divided into two sections. Right? The first section is the glorious Jesus. That's the first section and it'll finish here in 1018. Okay? And then the second section of the book is the glorious church of Jesus. And that's what we're going to start. So here he's finishing up the glorious Jesus. He's summarizing his argument. So another, the author uh, makes a final comparison of the two kinds of priests, Levitical priests, Jesus as priest. We move on to verse 11. He says, every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. So the Old Testament priest, even at the time that the writer of Hebrews was writing, the temple still was standing, the priests were still offering sacrifices every day. So he's talking as a contemporary here, all right? And, and he's saying, for what result? All of this for no results other than to remind a person of sin. And since sin is ever present, well, the work is never ending. Goes on to say, verse 12 to 14, but he, meaning Jesus, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet, for by one offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. So Jesus, as high priest, offers His perfect sacrifice according to God's will. He does it in heaven and He does it only one time. Jesus then sits down, the, the concept of sitting down, meaning the work is complete and only someone with authority can sit next to the king, or in this case, God the Father. He sits down at the right hand of God never to offer the sacrifice again. His work is done. He sits at a place of exaltation and power and authority, not like the Old Testament priests whose work is never finished. It's never finished because it doesn't accomplish, you know, its, its goal is not to take away sin, its goal is to remind people that they are sinners. And then finally, he says, Jesus has accomplished the purification of all men's souls. He's freed them from guilt and condemnation. There is no need for any more sacrifices. His has done the job. What do you think Jesus meant when He said on the cross, it is finished? He didn't just mean, you know, my, my suffering, my torture is finished. That's not what He's talking about. It is finished, the it he's talking about is the will of the Father to you know, send the Son, die for sins, purify man, guarantee heaven, all, all that there. It's finished, it's done. Notice when he said that, the uh, gospel writers say that the, the veil in the temple was split in two, why? Well, because now the, the separation between God and man has been removed once for all time. So the author makes his final appeal to the Old Testament saying that this is what God had promised all along. This is what He wanted. This is what His will was for man. And the nature and results of Jesus' sacrifice shows that He is in accordance with the scriptures on all of this. 
this was very important for the Jewish mind. You know, remember, he's, he's talking to former Jews who have become Christians and who are thinking of going back to Judaism. And so he really is appealing to the, to the Jewish mindset. Don't go back, he says, you're going back to something that doesn't work anymore. So verses 15 to 17, he says, and the Holy Spirit also testifies to us, for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws upon their heart and upon their minds I will write them. He then says, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. So this here is a quote actually from Jeremiah, chapter 31, verse 33. Here the prophet is revealing what the ultimate end of God's work among men will be. What does God want to do? Well, this is what God wants to do. Jeremiah says, God wants to give men a, a new covenant, new promises, a better deal. I, I'm not going to just remind you of your sin and your failure from now on. I'm going to solve the problem of your sin and failure once and for all, a better deal. Also, they will have an intimate knowledge of God and His will. They're not, they're not going to be far away anymore. They'll be able to come close. Remember that word, to know? To know not just intellectually know, but to know intimately. That word you know, in the Old Testament many times used, same verb, used to describe the intimate relationship between a husband and wife. You know, how many times the Bible say, and he knew her, meaning he was intimate with her. Well, that same verb, God is saying, I have something better for you. you know, when Jesus comes, when the Messiah comes, when this work is done and finished, you will know me. That's why he says, you know, I'll write my laws on your hearts. You will know me. You won't have to have somebody banging you over the head with the law. You will know me intimately. You will want to do my will. It isn't the threat of the law that's going to make you want to do my will. My will will be in your heart and you will desire it. Isn't that what Jesus is talking about in the Sermon on the Mount? Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness. What will happen to them? They'll be satisfied. They'll be satisfied. You know, don't be discouraged if you know, your, your hunger and thirst for being right with God and being right with yourself and being right with your neighbor and your brother and your wife, and that desire is not fully satisfied. Sometimes people get discouraged and they think, well, I'm not a very good Christian. You know, I'm not living up to all that. I, I can't even live up to what I, what I, what I want to be. Never mind what God wants me to be. I don't need to live up to what I want to be. Don't be discouraged. The fact that you have that hunger, that's the evidence that the Spirit is in you because people who don't have the Spirit of God have no desire to be right with God. It never even enters their mind that there is such a thing, or they should even try for such a thing. And then he says, uh, their sins will be forgiven and forgotten. That's, that's what God wants. Not just reminded year after year. You know, somebody says, will I remember my sin? Will I be myself in heaven? Like, will I know who I am? I believe I will. Otherwise, how is it heaven for me? <laughs> how is it heaven for me if I don't know who I am? But the, the interesting thing is, but I will not remember my sins like I do now. What a wonderful, what a wonderful thing that will be. I will know who I am, but I won't remember my sins anymore. Because if God has forgotten my sins, well certainly I'm not going to bring them up. I will no longer deal with myself based on my sins. I will no longer deal with you based on my perception of your sins. Verse 18, now where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. The author finishes by stating that once forgiveness has appeared, it means that the old is gone 
and the promises spoken of by the, apostle, uh, by the prophets rather, are now here. So in the last section of the first part of this epistle, remember I said two parts, right? The glorious Jesus, the glorious church of Jesus, right? So in the last section of the first part of this epistle, the, apostle, uh, the author brings home the point that Jesus' work as high priest is superior to that of Aaron and his descendants. First of all, he shows that Old Testament sacrifices never accomplished the cleansing of conscience from guilt, no matter how many animals were offered. He also demonstrates that Christ's sacrifice was effective to remove guilt because it was offered according to God's will. And thirdly, he summarizes his own arguments by comparing Jesus and the Levitical priests, excuse me, one last time. And he says about them that they, the priests, have an endless task that does not achieve true sanctification. But Jesus' sacrifice accomplishes God's will, and what is His will? Well, it was that Jesus be exalted and that we have redemption. This may be hard for, for us at times to understand or to accept. God wants to save us more than we want. You ever thought of that? <laughs> he wants to bring us to heaven even more than we want to go to heaven. Because he's paid such a price in order to achieve that. And yet so many times we're so down on ourselves, we're so, you know, we, we count ourselves out. <laughs> we, beat, we beat ourselves up. If we would remember that God wants us to be in heaven a whole lot more than, than we do, and He works at it every single day. And so the author's purpose was to compare Levitical the Levitical religious system and Jesus Christ and demonstrate Jesus' superiority as a person and as a minister for our spiritual needs. We had to learn a lot about, you know, in this class, certainly about the Jewish religion in order to make sense of what the author was saying as he compared the two. You know, we know a lot about Jesus, but we may not know a whole lot about the Jewish system. And you know, we've spent a lot of time giving some background. The author is going to draw his conclusions in the last few chapters that we'll look at the next, that we're going to look at next time. But before we do, I want to remind us of one fact here. This epistle demonstrates Christ's superiority to the Jewish religion, which was, after all, the most developed system of religion at that time. I mean, the Jewish system, the Jewish sacrificial system and everything that went with it was given, all of it, by God to the Jewish nation. So it was the most superior religion of its time. Remember I said the author here is not denigrating the religion, just showing how Jesus is superior to it. All right. The thing we need to remember is that with the Bible as a whole, we can demonstrate how Christ is superior to any religious system, past, present, and future. The author wasn't talking about systems. You know, he was talking about Jesus Christ, the resurrected Son of God, who is the ruler of the universe and will judge all men and all religions. So, you know, my encouragement is do not feel ashamed or afraid or embarrassed to claim that Christ is the only way to come to God. Sometimes we kind of timid about that, political correctness. Well, it's just not polite to say that Jesus is the only way, is the only way to, be, to be saved. It might not be politically correct, but it's biblically correct. You have to decide you know, which one you want to do. The author argued eloquently this case to the Jews uh, 2,000 years ago. The relevancy of his epistle is that we also must argue the same argument 
but perhaps in our generation we're making the argument to Muslims or Buddhists or Hindus or agnostics or atheists or whatever who have not received what only Jesus can give them and what will condemn them in the end and that is the forgiveness of sins. I don't know how much comparative religion uh, that, that you may have studied, maybe some of you took some courses in church or college or something like that, but you really begin to see the value of our faith, of Christianity, when you begin studying in depth other religions. I'm not just talking about the superficial stuff of other religions, you know, Mecca, two million people at Mecca, you know, whoa, what a well, you know, big scene, big. It's when you drill down into their religions and you begin to find out uh, their concept of who God is and what God wants and what God gives to mankind. If you do that, if you just lay them one next to another and just look at it objectively, I mean, there is no comparison. There's Christianity at number one spot and then there is no number two, number three, number four, number, you know, there's nothing until maybe you can get down to a hundred there and maybe you could slot one of those other ones in there. And I, this is not just you know, blowing wind here. There is no other religion that offers salvation by faith. Every other religion, every one of them offers some kind of salvation but always offered by works, by law keeping, by ritual, by this, by that. You know, the Muslims, you know, the five pillars, you've got to do the five pillars. You've got to pray five times a day. You have to give the zakat, you know, the, the, the tithe. You, you've got to keep Ramadan. You've got, you, know, you, you have to do these things. And even then when you do those things, there's no absolute certainty that you will go to paradise. Someone has said that every other religion, mankind you know, claws his way up to heaven. Every other religion, through aesthetic practices, you know, denial of the flesh or ritual or whatever. Every other religion, man climbs his way into heaven. Christianity is the only religion where God reaches down and brings man up to heaven with his own power were the only religion. And so he was making that argument to Jews. Let's not be afraid to make that argument to modern day whatever the religion is today. Have confidence, my brothers and sisters, not only in God's word, but have confidence in the religion that is formed by God's word, which is Christianity. Okay, so we finished the first section of the book, chapters one to chapters 10, verse 18, the glorious Jesus, superior to the Jewish religion. The last part of the book, he's going to talk about the glorious church of Jesus. If this is so, if he's you know, the Son of God, then what is the church like? How glorious is it? And that's where we're going to start uh, next time we're together. Okay, that's it for this time. Thank you for your attention.